Hello, I'm John Adams, editor of Digital Photo, and welcome to this video lesson where we're going to talk about RAW workflow. Now, RAW files are special image files that come straight off your camera's sensor and bypass all the processing that occurs inside the camera. But because they're special image files unique to your camera, they have to be converted to turn them into a regular image file like a JPEG. It's during this conversion process that you control how your pictures look. And when you consider that the process allows you to adjust the composition, the brightness of the highlight and shadow detail, the color, the sharpness, and even the overall exposure of the scene you've captured, it quickly becomes clear that RAW files offer photographers the ultimate route to the best possible quality. In a nutshell, it allows you to turn a shot like this into something like this, and it's all done inside the RAW converter. But with so many options on offer, you've got loads of sliders and settings and tabs and all sorts of things going on, where do you start? Well, what follows is a guide to RAW workflow that'll help you to go about the RAW conversion process in a systematic way. We'll use the Adobe Camera RAW plugin that's built into Photoshop to run through it. Now, of course, there are creative treatments and stylized effects that can be created in RAW by pushing the settings in more extreme ways. But if you follow this process for general shots, you'll have an easy path to follow that will soon become second nature, and you'll always be able to create a professional quality image from your RAW materials. So load up your RAW file or use workflow.dng from the Start Images folder. And before we begin, what's important to note is that you can't break a RAW file. Let's just have a look at that. If we, for example, let me just start pulling all these sliders all over the place. Let's make a complete mess of our image. There we go. If you end up with something that looks horrible and your final shot is not going to be anything like an award winner, don't worry. A RAW file never changes. All the settings that you make in these sliders are stored in a separate file. And if you get it horribly wrong and want to start over, there's one great get out of jail card. And if I just move my uh, interface over a little bit, all we've got to do is click on this little icon here on the edge of all the tabs, and we go to Camera RAW Defaults. Click on that and you'll return to your starting point. And there we have the original file untouched by any of those rather drastic changes we made. So when you open your picture into Photoshop, it'll load into the Camera Raw interface and you'll get something like this. If it looks like that and it's side on, then all you have to do is use these rotation arrows at the top of the interface here just to get it the right way round. Once you've done that, there's a handy tab in the full version called Lens Corrections. If you click on that, it's about halfway along. There's a box here called Enable Lens Profile Corrections. Tick that, and then often it will automatically detect the lens that was used and fill in the boxes. If it doesn't, then all you've got to do is click on the drop-down arrow and pick the lens you used. I used a Tamron in this example, and it's filled in the right lens underneath. Once you've done that, click on the Color sub-tab and tick Remove Chromatic Aberration. Chromatic Aberration is a posh word for fringing, and you'll see that sometimes on high contrast edges where you've got light and dark meeting in a very sharp edge. You'll see different colors around that edge, and that helps to minimize it. Now, this is one of the things you can't do in the Adobe Camera Raw supplied with Elements, so you can just ignore this step in your workflow if you're using Elements. Now, the next thing to do in your workflow is run a crop. That's if your image needs it. And to use the crop tool, simply click on the crop tool icon in the toolbar. And if you mouse down on it, you'll see a load of options. Normal means you can crop any way you like. And here we have different aspect ratios, depending on whether you want a square crop, a two to three crop, three to four, or whatever you want. Now, for this example, I'm going to keep the image in the same aspect ratio. So I'll go for the two to three option. Then all you have to do is drag a bounding box over your image and decide on how you want to crop it. I think I'll make sure that my uh, these little bits are coming in straight from the corners. So we've got that top corner coming in with uh, some content here. And we've got this fence line running in here. That looks pretty good there. I'll just broaden it out just slightly. There we go. That looks nice. And once you've established your crop, just double click inside the bounding box and it will show on screen. But you haven't actually cropped the image. Remember, the changes you make are just data changes that affect how the image is displayed. But you're not changing your raw. So if you want to go back and you don't like your crop anymore, click back on the crop tool and you'll see your original image there underneath. And if you want to revert, just hit the escape key up on the top left of your keyboard. Right, but we will take that crop, so I'll double click once more. And then we'll move on to the next stage in our raw workflow. And that 
involves making global contrast adjustments to the image. To do this, we need the Basic tab, and this is a tab that is shared also with Elements, like the Crop tool, and making contrast changes is an ideal place to start because it affects how much highlight detail and shadow detail you have in your picture. Before doing anything else, start with your highlight slider. If you drag that down, you'll compress the brighter tones and you can see that detail coming back into the sky. All those bright areas in the clouds, that restores a lot of it. And on this image, I'm happy with my highlights taken to minus 100. So that's the maximum negative setting in highlights and that gets lots of detail back in the bright tones. We're now going to look at the shadows, so I'm going to use this next slider and I'm going to move the shadows to a positive value. You can see that we've got detail coming back into the, the darker tones in the image. Not the very darkest, but the darker tones, the, uh, the quarter tones if you like. And we can take shadows sometimes to the, the maximum value. That looks a bit too much for this image, so I'm going to drop them off to around about 85. Of course we can always come back and adjust them if we want to. That looks pretty good there though. Now, one downside of adjusting shadows is you get a rather muddy, slightly washed out picture. There's a lack of contrast. Even though we've uh, compressed our tones, we need some rich, dark tones in there. And the way to compensate for that shadows boost is to use the black slider. And that's the next one we're going to use. Now, you can just move it from, uh, from left and right to see what it does. But there is a more scientific way of using the black slider, and that's to use it while you're holding the Alt key. When you do that, you'll see a mask view. And you can see where it turns black is where we have true black in the image. So you can see that we've got no black whatsoever while I'm holding the Alt key and moving the slider. But then we start to see our shadows coming in round about there, and that looks pretty good. So I've got a minus 82 setting, but this will change on every image. So there's nothing fixed about the numbers. You're just using the Alt key and your eyes to see where your black starts to appear. So that's looking good. I can then release the Alt key and see the difference it makes. You can see the image has got much more contrast in it now. We do the same thing with the white slider because that's going to set the white point of the very brightest area of the image. So once again, holding the Alt key, I can slide the whites to the right this time and see where pure white starts to invade the picture. And that's where it clips. Where it clips, where you see pure white, that means there's no detail present. We've hit the maximum brightness we can achieve within Photoshop. So we need to ease that back and just have a couple of spots of white, which indicates we've got very bright tones in there too. So that looks pretty good there. And what we now have is a full range of tones. And that's reflected in the histogram. You can see it stretching right the way across the graph. And if you want to see where your brightest and darkest tones are in the image, all you've got to do is click on these two triangles at the top of the histogram. The one on the right will show your highlight clipping warning. So that's where our, our whites have actually bleached out to pure white and the one on the left will show the shadows. So the, uh, the highlights are shown in red, the shadows are shown in blue. These aren't actually part of the image, it's just an overlay view. And if you're too lazy to click on them, there are handy shortcuts. Hit O and U on the keyboard to toggle them on and off. Now we can see we've got a full range of tones with only small areas clipping into pure black and pure white. Now we've got our basic contrast sorted, it's time to have a look at the color. And you'll see at the top of the basic tab, we've got white balance. Now, if you click in this drop down box, you'll see there's a list of all the different options that you'd normally find on your camera's presets. Because color isn't fixed in a raw file, so you can change your white balance to whatever you want it to be. So, with this option, daylight is a pretty good choice because that's what we're shooting in. But it's a little bit cloudy, so maybe we could try that as well. So we could go for the cloudy setting. And that looks a bit warmer, a bit more inviting. So I think we'll go somewhere around there. You can tweak the white balance setting if you want to. If you move the temperature slider to left and right, you'll make the image cooler or warmer. And then you will override your white balance setting and it will appear as custom. But that's okay. We're going to go for a setting of about ooh, 6350, I think, in this one. So it's somewhere between cloudy and daylight. And that looks pretty good to my eyes there. Now the tint slider is really used when you're shooting in either mixed light sources or using fluorescent lamps. It basically gives you a green to magenta shift in the color palette of the image. And uh, in most cases, unless you're shooting in fluorescent lights, you want this somewhere between the minus 10 and plus 10 setting. And often where it's set will be absolutely fine. But I'm going to set this to about plus 7 in this example. That looks pretty good there. So that's good for our overall global color changes, but there are some sliders at the bottom of the palette that are interesting as well. So we'll just go down to the bottom and you'll see here we've got vibrance and saturation. 
Vibrance is the most useful of the two because vibrance actually intensifies the least saturated colors. So if we move vibrance up to the right, we get more intense colors without them being overbearing. Move it to the left and we just kind of knock them back a bit. Saturation, however, is indiscriminate in the way it saturates colors. So that will intensify everything. So even highly saturated colors will be blown. So it's very easy to break an image using saturation, whereas it's, uh, it's much easier to keep things under control using vibrance. So I'm gonna leave saturation set to zero in this example, and I'm just gonna move vibrance up a little bit to something, ooh, uh, something like 18 or so. That still looks natural, but I have amplified the colors slightly in the picture. The golden rule is really to think about vibrance first and think about saturation as a last resort if you're desperate to boost your colors. So now we're through the global changes, we can move on to local changes because sometimes you want some areas to be different to others in an image. Now you can't do this in elements because it only has the basic tab and the detail tab. We'll come on to that later. But in Photoshop, you can actually make local adjustments to your raw file. And this is done via some tools up in the toolbar at the top of the interface and the first one we'll look at is the graduated filter tool. So if we click on that we get another set of basic sliders pretty much and we can drag out graduated filters just like the grads you'd place in front of the lens if you wanted to hold back the brightness of a sky compared to the foreground. Now before you use it you need to set it up and the easiest way to reset all these sliders is simply to uh, use something like the exposure slider, use the little minus icon to one side of it and that will zero all the other sliders in the list and just move your exposure to minus 0.5. Once you've got that set you can then drag the grads, just drag, click and drag on the image and you'll see the graduated filter appear. You can see a slight darkening there. And if you want to make it even darker still at the top, then all you've got to do is move the exposure slider down. And you'll get that uh, richer, darker vein at the top of the picture. Now, grads aren't just for skies. You can use them in a positive way on foregrounds as well. And by in a positive way, I mean you can use a positive value in the exposure. So all you've got to do is drag another grad up from the bottom. At the moment, we've got the settings we used on our sky, so it's made it darker. But we can change that by simply moving the exposure slider to a more positive value. And you can see there we've brightened the foreground. But in this example, what I'm going to do is have some dark areas within the foreground. So I'm going to set that back to where it was. And I'm just going to move this grad around. Of course, it's all editable. I'm going to move this over so it only affects this part of the image. So we'll bring in a little bit of shadow in that bottom part here. And I think I'll bring another one in here. These are all the same grad I'm using, all the same settings. But we now have three grads in the picture, one to darken the top of the sky, one to add a little bit of shading in this bottom part here, and another bit of shading in this part here. So that's three quick grads we've added that are helping to uh, make the image look a bit better. And if you want to thicken a graduated filter effect, it's sometimes easier to add another one. For example, it's very common to add a strip at the top of the sky. We've added one grad here on the sky, and then we can simply add another one by dragging down to give that nice darkening at the top. That's looking a bit heavy though, so all I'll do is move the exposure slider back up a little bit just to, to neuter it slightly, and that's looking nice there. So that's some local adjustments made with the graduated filter, but there's another local adjustment tool, and that's next to it, and it's called the adjustment brush. Use this next, and here you can pick out particular areas that you want to change. Once again, like the graduated filter, the easiest thing to do first is just click on the minus button next to exposure, and that will zero your sliders. What we now need to do is set a brush size. We can use the left and right square brackets keys to adjust brush size. I think something like that will be okay. I've got a slight burnout on this area of this dry stone wall here, and I'm just gonna paint over that. And there's my lower exposure just applied to that area. And you'll see a pin appear. And if we mouse over that pin, you can see the area is shown as a mask view, so you know where you've been. So that's the wall looking good, but I could do with making this tree stand out a bit more. And I'm going to create another adjustment brush now, so I just click on New, and then I can just uh, get a bigger brush, there we go, something like that, and just paint over the tree. Now it's gone dark because my adjustment brush is set to dark, but I'm only worried about the area at the moment because I can make it brighter afterwards. Grab hold of the exposure slider, and I can just move it up a little bit just to brighten that tree. And of course, I can apply any adjustments to this adjustment brush. So I may want to warm it up a bit with the temperature. Just give that a bit more warmth. That's looking quite nice. And I can also use the highlights and shadow sliders to add an extra kick to those areas too. So something like that could be pretty good.
Now, if you've spilt over the edge using your adjustment brush, that's OK, because we've just got to make sure our, our brush is active. That's the area we're, we're working on. Then we click on Erase, and we can use another brush. I'll just increase brush size now to rub out the changes. So we can simply work around and make sure we've got a good blend between the adjusted area and the background. So we can get rid of that slight brightening in the sky to keep everything looking nice and even. There we go. And you can even use the adjustment brush to do some subtle relighting of a scene. If I want to put a cloud shadow in here, for example, I can simply go to a new adjustment brush. Then I can just paint over that area, take the exposure down a little bit, and there we get a nice subtle shadow appearing on that part of the hillside. But if you make an adjustment change that you're not sure about and you think, well, I didn't really want to do that, that's OK. Just click on the brush to make it active, and then you can just hit backspace and that will get rid of it. So you can add as many adjustment brushes and graduated filters as you want. You can add them on the fly. And if ever you don't like it, click on the pin, hit backspace, and you get rid of it. And once you're through making your local adjustments, all you've got to do to get out of that particular interface of it is just click on the hand tool or the zoom tool. That's the quickest way to exit it. And you go back to your normal controls on the overall image. So that's our picture looking great. But one final thing you can do with the raw converter is do some sharpening. Now, often you want to do sharpening in Photoshop or Elements if you're going to do some more work to it. I wouldn't suggest you sharpen first and then do some layer work or further editing. Only do your sharpening in a raw converter if you're happy with the overall picture and you're not doing anything else with it. And to do some sharpening, the first thing you want to do is zoom in to about 100%. Go into about 100 and that gives you a detailed view of the image. Find somewhere that's sharp inside the picture. You can do that by just scrolling around with the hand tool. We'll, uh, we'll look at these, uh, the edge of these trees here, something like that. And then click on your Detail tab. That's where your sharpening is controlled. What we're going to do is move the amount, first of all, up to about 100. That's a general sort of a good starting point for a sharpening effect. Radius is normally fine on one pixel. Detail is normally fine on 25, so there's no real reason to change those. But the important slider you want to know about is masking, because masking allows you to only affect particular areas when you sharpen an image. Sharpening itself doesn't refocus an image. It won't turn a blurred picture into a sharp one. What it does, it accentuates the contrast on hard edges in the picture. And by using the masking control, you can make sure it's restricted just to those edges. So what we do, we hold down the Alt key and then move the masking slider. And as you'll do, you'll see a white and black mask. The black areas remain unsharpened. They're completely left alone by the sharpening effect. And the white areas are sharpened. So you'll find on a lot of images, if you just want edge detail sharpened, that your masking slider will be set fairly high. And I've got it set to about 90 here. That looks pretty good. And if we come back to the full view, if we just uh, click our zoom level controls, we go back to our full screen, or you could just double click the hand tool to do the same thing. If we now hold down the Alt key and mouse down on the masking slider, you can see which areas are affected. And you can see there it's just our edges and not the sky. And so we haven't affected the areas that don't need any sharpening. And that's our workflow sorted and our raw conversion complete. Now, when you've finished your raw conversion, if you click on Done, all the changes you've made in your raw converter will be saved to a sidecar XMP file. That contains all the data. And the next time you open your raw, you'll see it in that state. But you haven't actually saved the image itself. To save the image as a JPEG or a TIFF or a PSD or any other file format, what you need to do is click on Open Image. So if we click on that now, then our picture will load into the regular interface of Photoshop or Elements if that's the software you're using. To save it, all you have to do is do the normal saving process. So go to File, choose Save As, and then pick the format you want to use. JPEG is often the best option if you want to share your work online or send it to anybody. Pick the destination where you want to put it, such as the desktop, and then hit Save. You get another dialog box asking you about the JPEG options. And all you've got to do is work out the trade-off between image quality and file size. And normally, level 10 will give you that best trade-off. Level 12 will give you a much bigger file. Level 0 will give you a very small file, but very poor quality. So level 10 will normally do the job quite nicely. Hit OK, and the job's done. So I hope you enjoyed that. That's an ideal kind of systematic way to work with raw files. And if you practice that workflow technique, 
you won't go far wrong when it comes to making general image conversions. I hope that's been helpful in establishing a good order in which to do things in a raw converter. And I also hope you'll agree that that picture looks rather better than the fairly flat file that we started with. All right, enjoy sorting out your raw workflow and I'll see you next time.